You're listening to Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, a podcast offered in partnership with Missio Alliance. Each episode, we discuss internal and relational pressures, how they block effective leadership, and how we can move through them to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuts. All right, friends, here's the fact. I'm wearing my Ted Lasso socks. I'm drinking peppermint tea out of my Fred Rogers uh, color activated mug. For those of you, obviously, we're an audio podcast, not a video one. When Fred is cold, he's wearing his suit. When I put in my hot peppermint tea, he's wearing his cardigan. His suit becomes a cardigan. And Ian Cron is a guest on my podcast. All is well and all manner of things will be well. Uh, Obviously, Ian is very renowned. In fact, probably one of the top world's experts in all things Enneagram. And that's primarily what we'll be talking about because Ian has a brand new book out on the Enneagram, an Enneagram journey. The book is called The Story of You, an Enneagram journey to becoming your true self. What I love about this book, I've read this book. I had a privilege of getting a copy of it ahead of this interview. I love this book because I was actually first introduced to Ian through his storytelling. Uh, He is a first class maestro storytelling, as many of my listeners know. I love a good story. I love quality writing. When I was in the thick of deep anxiety as being a lead pastor, I I somehow stumbled across a book called Chasing Francis. I believe it was Ian's first book where he kind of shared, uh, through a fictionalized account, he shared his own journey of deconstruction, the challenges of the lead role when Ian was a lead pastor. And uh, I, I took that book so seriously that when I got to do some traveling, I made a point to go to a CC, largely because of that book. Ian followed up with an incredible memoir uh, about his life uh, with Jesus, his father, the CIA. I won't spoil it, but another amazing book. And then, of course, The Road Back to You, which is probably what Ian is most famous for, as well as his incredible podcast, Typology. But the book that just dropped in December, The Story of You. What I love about this book is Ian gets into our childhoods. He, he uses narrative. He shares a lot of people's stories. And once he sets up the framework of how what happened to us as kids and how we make meaning of it, the story we tell ourselves, he then puts it through the lens of the nine uh, numbers on the Enneagram. Ian, what a treat to have you on the show. Thank you for joining me. It's a delight. I can't wait. Great. So Ian, Enneagram, you're an Episcopal priest. You're a therapist. It's, it's, you, you have all of these angles in which you help us kind of unlock ourselves. Let's just get right into the story we tell ourselves Maybe you'd, you'd start by letting us know what is the story we tell ourselves and just how is it formed in our earlier memories as kids? Mm. Well, you know, um, I think as, as little people, all of us begin to craft and subscribe to a narrative about who we are and how we think the world works based on things like trauma little t or capital T, uh, based on the internalized messages and taken for granted beliefs that we pick up from our parents, uh, and those can be real or perceived from our parents, from our friends, from our coaches, from our culture, uh, from all the important people in, in our lives. Now, those stories, and I would say that for the most part, these are broken stories. Um, these stories really help us in childhood to make sense of the world, to make sense of our experience. Um, without those stories, as you know, we would begin to fall prey to literal pathology, right? If you don't have a narrative, your life becomes incoherent, right? So we need one. But unfortunately, we unconsciously drag those stories into adulthood in such a way that, as Carl Jung said, that which helps you in the morning of life uh, will undo you in the afternoon of life. That's a bastardization of the quote, but that's essentially <laughs> what, what, what he says. Yeah. And as you know, if you drag those stories and continue to live by their dictates in, in uh, adulthood, they're going to really make a mess of your life. And so I think the Enneagram is so helpful in this regard because I think what it presents us with are nine archetypal stories that we see so often in the general population that we probably ought to pay attention to them, right? I, I don't know if this is every story that people tell themselves. But I do think, gosh, we see them so much that I'm sure that 99% of readers will find one and say, gosh, that story really sounds like mine. 
And then in the story of you, what I begin to do is help people deconstruct that story, to exhume it, to deconstruct it, and begin the process of reauthoring uh, an adult story versus living in a children's book for your whole life. Great. Yeah, you just mentioned in passing, Ian, the little T traumas and the big T traumas. Once in a while in my work, I'll run into people that tend to minimize this kind of work. They'll I'll say, look, you know, my parents were great. It, like as, as if the idea that going back into childhood experience is somehow looking for someone to blame, that's really not what you're doing here. Maybe you'd be willing just to talk briefly about little T, big T traumas for those of us who wouldn't look back on our childhood as a traumatic experience. Sure. Well, I don't think anyone's born into this broken world can pass through it without some level of trauma. I just don't think it's possible, Right. Now, when I mean by little t trauma, it could be complex trauma, right, where we just kind of go through low-level trauma over a long period of time, sort of repeated trauma, maybe on the same theme in the same way or not. And then, of course, we have big T trauma, which usually is around some singular event uh, that we had no capacity to process in the moment. It just flooded us, overwhelmed us. Um, And that's a a different kind of of an experience. But, you know, uh, I I just don't know how anybody can escape from the, the, you know, the bruising of living in a broken world, right? Uh, Now, people could call it something other than trauma, but I think that's probably a, a, a better term, you know? Now, when I meet people who say I had a really charmed childhood... And, you know, I really don't have anything to work through. I I actually have a a label for that. It's called reality resistance disorder. (laughs) It's, you know, come on. I mean, you know, really, it's it's uh, which of us doesn't have work to do to uh, repair um, that which was broken to become the highest expression of ourselves in, in the world. And maybe I would just finish with this. I just believe all of us are recovering children, all of us. And so we're all in recovery mode here. And uh, that's part of the journey is to face uh, that which was that we might live in this present moment as the, the people we were designed to be. Yeah. In the story of you, you start to explore the holy virtues, the passions and the vices that each of these nine types tend to struggle with. I I wasn't thinking we would go around the whole circle, but you identify as an Enneagram four. I identify as a three. I wonder if we would just start there. What would be a a passion uh, and a virtue of a four and a passion and a virtue of a three? Sure. So according to the Enneagram, uh, we all have a a passion and and, uh, early pioneers of the Enneagram began to notice that each of the nine types had a passion based on the seven deadly sins plus two. Um, <laughs> right? I don't know who decided they had the presumption to presume they could add to, but they're pretty dang good, so let's leave them. Um, and then uh, that, and that passion is an, a powerful emotional motivator that can, can, continues to fuel the self-defeating aspects of the type. The virtue is antidotal, right? It, it's uh, In the book, I talk about the uh, this thing called a Jerry Contra, which St. Ignatius of Loyola came up with, literally means to go against, right? How do we go against the passion that continues to feed these negative, repetitive patterns of personality so that, and I guess this kind of goes to neuroplasticity, right? So that we can kind of rewire ourselves to begin to do reflexively the opposite of what we used to do that was so damaging to us. So for a three, the, the passion is deceit. Now, that let's remember that the underlying premise of the story of the three, the story that you inhabit and have inhabited since the time you were a little kid, might be described as you have a need to succeed, to appear successful, and to avoid failure at all costs. The passion of the three is deceit because oftentimes what the three will do, and they do it masterfully, is be, to, they've learned to adopt very early on masks or personas that they can swap out uh, in order to win the admiration of whoever it is they happen to be in the presence of, a group or an individual. Um, In many ways, it's because the three believes that 
Uh, we live in a world in which people only value others for what they do and accomplish rather than for who they are. And so obviously you're swapping out masks to become pure successful, to try and win the admiration of the other. Now, the virtue that they have to move toward then is authenticity. Uh, and, and that is not, by the way, and I would make a difference here because I was asked on this about this yesterday on an interview. I, I make a, dif- a, a sort of a differentiate between calculated transparency and authenticity. And you know, as a pastor, I, I've been to lots of mega churches in my life where I see a pastor, he's got ink or all over himself and he's, you know, too old for it. And, uh, <laughs> yes. and, and he's up there and he's talking about, oh man, you know, I really struggle with this and that. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, that doesn't sound like authenticity. It sounds like calculated transparency. And often it's a three. And what they're doing is they're spinning, you know, some kind of, you know, brokenness and like, you know, throwing it out there. But I, what I don't feel in the moment is the hair on the back of their neck standing up, the lump in their throat, the sweat on their lip, you know, where that to me is a sign, the heart pounding. That's the sign that, man, you're, you're really, the authenticity is sort of characterized, I think, by this profound sense of vulnerability and the thought running through your head, damn it, I don't want to do this, but I feel I'm called to, you know. Uh, so that's the journey for the three. Yeah, I think as I'm hearing you talk about that, Ian, I, I think as a three and as a preacher, the, I can feel the difference in, inside of me, the temptation to exaggerate, sound more impressive than I am, maybe take a story and edit it to be a little more sensational than it really is, all of that. I can feel that. And then what you, I love what you're describing about uh, this, this kind of pseudo transparency. To me, the, the threshold is, am I safe? And if I'm still safe, it's probably not authentic. Mm. But if I'm actually at risk of being rejected, like for exposing myself, then uh, it's probably more authentic. Each of us have that different threshold as we go around the circle. How can we notice when we've crossed from, you know, vice to virtue or virtue to vice? Is, is there a little thing inside us where you coach us on how to notice that shift? Sure. I, you know, I think, you know, there was a study done at Cornell and I, it was really business centered, but I think it can be generally applied to life. It says the key predictor of success in business and leadership is self-awareness. And, and I would say that the key to success in life is self or, or a, a one key predictor of success in life is self-awareness, meaning the capacity to step back, the learned capacity to step back and with a neutral self-compassionate gaze to observe how it is that you're acting, thinking, and feeling in the moment, and then beginning to make adjustments, right? To, to align what you're doing, thinking, and feeling in the moment with your values, with what you know is right, uh, with, what, with, with the person that you, you really feel called to be. And that, takes, that actually takes some training, you know, yeah. the capacity to do what I'm saying. Because most people live on autopilot, right? They're just in reactivity, and, and I would be saying, look, I want to teach you how to be living in responsiveness and receptivity versus reactivity. And that capacity is that ability to, again, with self-compassion, to monitor, okay, what's happening in my inner world right now? Am I living in authenticity? Am I being deceptive right now? You know, you were describing it. You know, I, I can feel it in the moment yeah. when I'm, you know, I'm not being, I'm, I'm spinning things or I'm embellishing or I'm trying to make myself look good and, you know. Uh, versus just wanting to tell the truth in such a way that it, it will bless the people I'm speaking with. Um, and I think for all nine types, these stories that are so powerful and so, so sticky, um, we, we have to learn the ability to, to learn our, our propensities for living in virtue and vice and, and then step back and say, where am I right now? And do I need to make some adjustments to live in the true self of, of who I am? Okay, so some of the people of these different types have a harsher inner critic than others, particularly, let's say, the people who identify as an Enneagram one, they're going to have some of the harshest inner critic. Uh, What I've noticed when I do my workshops on lowering reactivity and things like that is is my Enneagram one people, all all they're doing is they're co-opting my tools as another way to condemn themselves. Yes. So what you just gave us is this incredible gift where you said, you know, use curiosity and self-compassion. Yes. But then in Enneagram 1, 
can even say, well, you're not doing that very well. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it, yes. getting out of that, um, getting out of the way of yourself is a really tricky thing. H how do you help say an Enneagram one or any, any of the numbers that have that harsher inner critic, that strong voice of condemnation? How do you help them pause long enough to start to mistrust it, I guess I would ask? Sure. Yes. You know, it's amazing that we are so loyal to our broken stories, right? Mm. Uh, even though they, they uh, uh, are so self-limiting. You know, here's a really funny way that I've worked with one. So it's going to sound dumb because we all have an inner critic, right? Some are just the volume is a little bit louder than others, right? Yeah. Because we fall short of some ideal uh, view of ourselves and then the degree to which we fall short, right? The more we fall short, the louder the inner critic becomes. I tell people, I want you to write down what it is that you're telling yourself, right? Tell me, write down the stream of negative self-commentary running through your head right now, or just note it. And then what I want you to do in the moment is I want you to sing it out loud to the sound of, to the tune of happy birthday, <laughs> right? So it's something like this. I'm the worst parent in the world. I will never be worth anything. You know, just, just write it down and sing it out loud. And what they begin to realize is how absurd the stream and how, and how the, the stream of negative self-commentary is just that. It's just words going by. It has, you know, it's just because you think it doesn't make it true. So, you know, it's like just the process of doing it. They just start to laugh at themselves. Mm. They laugh at the stream of negative self-commentary. They don't deride it. They don't, you know, like uh, look at it and say, this is, see how stupid it is. It's just like, look how silly this is, right? Um, and uh, I can't tell you how many people have told me that that goofy exercise has helped them. They'll do it in the car. They'll, like they'll, They can feel the weight of it hitting them in the house. They go, don't wait a second. Just walk around the house singing this, you know, uh, as loud as you can. Other types, I'll say, I want you to just read your stream of negative self-commentary or just as you in the moment as it's hitting you and use a whiny voice. So it's like this. I'm no good. <laughs> I wish I was. And I said, it just begins to help it evaporate. You know, it's almost like the grip of that thing begins mm. to loosen. And so, yeah, kooky therapeutic advice, but there it is. Oh, it's so helpful because I do think the voice of our inner critic, uh, the, the treadmill that, that our, our, our vice has put us on, is very earnest, right? It, it, it's so serious. And, and even like one of my favorite systems here is Carl Whitaker. He, he really uses playfulness and absurdity uh, as a tool to dislodge it. I love that you're giving us just that simple kind of way. The other thing I've noticed, Ian, I'd love to get your reaction to is I've, I've, I've done inner critic work. I've noticed that when I, when I live into a story, like a lot of what you're writing about in the story of you, is the simple idea that we have agency, that we are able to create a new story for ourselves and then live into it. Uh, what I've noticed as a 50-year-old man now is that story keeps updating and changing. I'm still fundamentally who I am, but there's growth and progress. My inner critic as the same damn message it had when I was like 12. It's never updated for my current circumstance and it's helped me to mistrust it. I, I, I first noticed that in the Russell Crowe movie uh, where he really struggled with uh, paranoid schizophrenia and he was able to notice that the voices had never aged. It was like Bart Simpson. Like, so my yes. inner critic is Bart Simpson. He never grows up and yet why am I still giving him all of this attention? Um, what's your reaction to that? Well, two things. One is, it's a wonderful insight. You know, I actually am of the school that, and this is a little bit of internal family systems, right? Mm. Which is, um, look, that inner critic had and has good intentions, mm. right? It, it, you know, you didn't launch that. Your ego did not launch that, that pattern of thinking because it didn't like you. It had some positive, for whatever reason, your little brain as a little person decided, you know, I need an inner critic to, for whatever reason, to help me in life. The problem is, is it's still running. And so it's part of an old story. Uh, and now it's just so deeply grooved that, you know, it's like, well, how do I begin to rewind it? And, and you may never, none of us are ever going to completely get rid of an inner critic. 
I think what we can do, as you said, is begin to say, I think we can begin to parent the inner critic. Mm. We, we can begin to say to the inner critic, look, I really appreciate what you tried to do or have tried to do for me as a, as a little person. And, uh, but I want you to know that, that um, I'm here now. This adult Ian is here now. And um, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure you're all right. I, I, don't, I don't really need you to serve me in this way anymore. And so I, I'm of the school, unlike a lot of teachers, that you need to befriend the inner critic, not beat it over the head with a hammer. I mean, it's not, you know, not say, shut up, don't do this. It's mm -hmm. like, no, make friends. You know, it, it actually had good intentions when it started. And uh, I think that goes a long way for that, that self-compassion. I think it's a way of practicing what I call unconditional self-friendship, which I think is terribly important in the journey of adopting a new and better story for yourself. Mm, I love that. Thank you. So in the story of you, you lay out a path for us. Like you, you, in each chapter, you, you focus on each number. You have all of these people. And what I love about the book is how you, it, it feels like we can find ourselves in these stories because you've given us real people and their struggles and but you do lay out a path for us, Ian, uh, called uh, SOARS, obviously my Aussie accent, uh, S-O-A-R-S. Would you lay out for us those steps? What are those steps? Yeah. Well, part of my intention in the road back to you wasn't just to identify the stories, but like, well, how do we begin the process of, you know, deconstructing them, uh, decoupling ourselves from their power in our lives, and to recognize that, you know, we are not stuck. You know what I mean? Like we do have agency to um, uh, rewrite these stories. Like, guess what? You're the narrator. And, 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 uh, you know, uh, in my experience, most people, when you tell them that they look at you like, really? Like, I just thought I was stuck with this because, you know, these are the cards that were dealt and yeah, blah, blah. And I had no idea. You know, in the book, I, I quote Dan McAdams, who is a professor at Northwestern University. He's the pioneer of what's called narrative therapy, which was a big influence in, in helping me write this book. Uh, and he just says, all transformation is story transformation. Now, that's an amazing statement. Like, you can't change who you are until you change the underlying premise of the story in which you live. And so if I went through, and this is amazing, too, like, when you look at the underlying premise, the unconscious motivation of all nine Enneagram types, what you will see is that they are in direct opposition to the story of God. Now, that's an amazing deal, because that's how you know for a fact that they're broken stories. So for the one, do you act at, where, where in your tradition, for example, Steve, does it, does it say... I need to be perfect and I need to perfect others in the world in order to realize love in my life. Where, where does it say, I, I, for Enneagram 2s, where does it say that in order to find love from others and from God, I need to meet the needs of everybody else while at the same time disowning my own personal needs? And I could go through all nine types. Yeah. Now, the underlying premise of that story is where the change, changing, you know, uh, interrogating and, and, and beginning to soften that story to adopt a new one is where the money is. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's, where the, that's where the money is. So, sore. Sorry it took me a minute to get to it. No, great. Uh, the first thing we want to do, and I think, on the journey is we got to see the story we've been living. You know, Wendell Berry has this great quote. It's in the book, right? He says, if you don't know where you're from, you'll have a hard time saying where you're going. And you know this as a therapist, right? We don't want to camp out in the past forever, but we do have to see where the old story began to really exhume those hurtful events, the unchallenged, uh, taken for granted beliefs and the un helpful internalized messages from childhood that continue to rule our lives today, right? And, and you and I would call that an origin story, right? Um, as, as therapists. Th then the next step is to own. And that, in, that involves exploring the, the, both the shadow side as well as what Carl Jung would call the golden shadow, that which is beauti beautiful about us for each type. And then Obviously, this is an uncomfortable but really he healing exercise. Um, 
you know, for me as an Enneagram 4 and a person in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction for uh, quite some time, um, you know, part of the journey was saying, okay, my story is an Enneagram 4. This belief that there was something so fundamentally broken in me, some unnameable fatal flaw that I had to compensate for by being special and unique, and this belief that I would never belong or be whole in the world with that, et cetera, right? That story led to my, in many ways, becoming an addict and an alcoholic, right? I mean, that belief, right? It launched a story that in, now it helped me as a little kid, but in adulthood, it got me into treatment, <laughs> right? That story no longer served me. Right. Yeah. So I had to own, well, what did that do to my friends? And what did it do to my family? What did it do to me living in this story? And just to kind of begin to inventory it. Right. Again, with self-compassion. Right. But rigorous honesty. Then the, mm-hmm. the third thing I would say is then we have to awaken. Awaken means okay, here are these beliefs and here are these internalized messages and here is this passion that continued to fuel the old story, right? How do I awaken, as you were mentioning earlier, to those moments when I know I'm falling back into the old story? How do I develop the self-awareness and the self-knowledge that will help me to go, "Uh uh-oh, red flag, here I go again. Let me just, can I just give you a quick story to illustrate that? Please, yeah. Okay, you mentioned earlier I'm an Episcopal priest. I don't have a parish. I'm, I'm a volunteer priest at the at St. Augustine's Chapel at Vanderbilt University. And uh, I'm, it's an Easter. I'm standing in front uh, of a packed congregation, a room. And in the front row, there is a man and his son, and they are both wearing blue and white seersucker suits with identical bow ties. And dad's got his arm around the son's 10-year-old shoulders, and they're just singing, you know, Christ the Lord is risen today, right? And as a four, struggling with the passion of envy, having had a terrible relationship with a father who himself died of drug and alcohol addiction, all of a sudden I could feel the envy and the, the comparing myself to this tableau in front of me and, and feeling inferior and like, oh, why didn't I have that experience and why blah, 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 blah. And because I was able in the moment and I've worked enough on self-awareness to step back and say, uh-oh, I know what's going on right now. And I said to myself, dude, it's Easter. <laughs> it's Easter. You know, and and this is the day of resurrection. And do you really want to go back to that dead old story or would you Mm. rather live in one that is new and living? Uh, The old is past, brother. Let's move into this this new new story. So that's the awaken piece. Finally, the rewrite piece is really the process of beginning to ask yourself, all right, what, what would the new story look like for me? that I feel called to live in, that's reflecting my values and my beliefs and my faith or whatever it is for each person. And that's a a little bit of a process of self-reflection. It it involves some writing. Of course, there's a workbook coming out in May that's going to help people walk through this process as well. Um, And, you know, that, that process of rewriting our narrative is so beautiful. It's so wonderful to be able to say, I don't live in that story anymore. Now what's the new story in which I want to live? And how do I put that new story in service to what I know God is up to in the world? Mm. Right? Yeah. That's, that's the journey. Yeah. I, I think the vision you're laying out for us, Ian, it's a beautiful vision. It's like we can stay stuck in a false story. At the end of the day, if we continue to let that story drive us. We're living in a false reality, or we can actually be free in the truth. I I, I know in in my own life, I I feel like the counterintuitive lesson is that I I used to believe that uh, selflessness was focusing on others. What I came to discover in my experience as a trauma chaplain was that focusing on others was avoidance. That's what it was. I thought I was being selfless because what what I can do is I can open the Bible and co-opt onto the words of Scripture my own false narrative and then see that false narrative in there, if that makes sense. And that's what I was doing as a chaplain. And so my impulse to say something, to manage 
people's experience. I, I think for me, the gift was that, that there's something absolute about grief and death. I would imagine it's a similar absolute that addiction. I, I imagine in some ways addiction leads you to the end of yourself rapidly. That was my experience with grief and death. Going into rooms every day, multiple times a day and facing death. If I was not aware of what was going on inside of me, I was useless to those people. That's what was mm. true. Mm -hmm. Because I would, I would walk into an emergency room. The gurney is busting through the double doors. The adrenaline's flying. People are yelling. There's paddles. And I'm busy saying, please, God, don't let it be my wife, Lisa, on that gurney. And then when it's not Lisa, I'm busy throwing a party in my head. Thank you, God, that it's not my wife which is very similar to the prayer of the Pharisee. Thank you, God, I'm not like that person. Mm. And I can't emotionally connect to those people if I'm having a party. Th th this Friday, Ian, I'm doing a funeral for a friend of mine's mother. I buried her dad when she was a teenager in our youth group. Her mom suddenly died this last week. And if I didn't do the work you're describing, I would be useless to her. Because mm. I'd be, I would be unaware of how anxious I am to do something. Mm. This is, I, I'm infamous, I'm sorry to say, Ian, for my convoluted questions. How much of the work you're describing has to do with, for some of us, self-restraint? The ability, you, you mentioned before, we kind of have this impulse, this reactivity. How much of this work you're calling us to is about restraining ourselves? How important is that in your mind? Mm. Well, you know, um, this shift from reactivity to living receptively in the world is really important. Um, Martin Laird is a Catholic priest at Villanova who I really love his work. And he, he, he likes to say that reactivity is, is like being inside of an old British telephone booth trapped in it with a murder hornet. And you're just kind of like flailing around mm. and you're just... Uh, to everything that comes, right? Every triggering thing that someone says to you from behind the counter at CBS or whatever, and you're just being hooked in. And uh, you're not able in the moment to step back and say, now, and here's the question you can ask to throw yourself into responsiveness. What does love require of me right now? What does love require of me in this moment? Uh, and that gives you the, the ability to do what I would call the sacred pause, which is in the space between a trigger or a stimulus and a response, right? You step into that, into that space between them, and you're able to, at least for a few seconds, tap the brake, push in the clutch, right? Disengage the transmission mm -hmm. and ask yourself, okay, so this happened. No, what does love require of me in this moment? Rather than my ego taking over and saying, I got to defend my ego. I got to defend my, you know, my, uh, you know, I got to defend my honor in, in this moment, or I have to take control here. And no, it's like, no, just step back. And by the way, it, I think as we write new stories, that part of the journey is, is learning how to step into the sacred space between uh, a stimulus, a trigger and a response so that we have new freedom to make different choices than when we were just in reactivity autopilot, right? So it's a, it's a lovely place to live when you can, and I think it's an adult place to live mm. when, when you're able to, to, you know, make that, that sacred pause and, and, and ask yourself, uh, who am I in this? Who, what would the person, the star of my new story, which is me, <laughs> right? Or the co-star anyway, uh, is me, what, what would that person do in this moment? Mm. I'll, I'll trade you one Catholic writer for another. I, I've been studying Herbert McCabe lately, mm. and he uh, he's new to me, and I've been wonderfully provoked by him where he, he says, you know, if we take away all of the moral layers we put around the word sin and just look at what sin does, it, is it infects our thinking so that uh, God's view of us doesn't change, but we think God's view of us changes. And so we then project onto God a, a condemning view or a disappointing view or whatever. So the reason right. to try to live free the way you're describing, which I think McKay would use the language of living without sin, 
not in that perfect way that we get messed up in so many of our churches, but just free, as it improves our chances of, of living in a true story of God. Yes. My theory is that, uh, you know, the very first temptation of humans was you can be like God and, and that our broken story is our effort to do that. How do you help us to see God's true story over the story we tell ourselves? Yeah, so there's actually a paper that was written years ago. I can't remember the guy's name. I think it was last name was Johnson. It was a brilliant paper. I'd encourage you and your listeners to read it. it it's called uh, How We Lost Our Story. I think that's what it was. And basically what he says is, you know, back in the Middle Ages and prior to um, the age in which we live, you know, people all sort of saw the world through a, a biblical lens, whether they believed it or not, right? There, there was, okay, uh, and that, that lens um, permeated all of culture, right? And we've lost that story. I, I understand the Bible and God as a, as a narrative, and it's a story uh, of God's relationship with us or throughout history. And my the whole thing is, look, we have to create a story of Steve and Ian that, that fits underneath the umbrella of that larger story. I was asked in an in a, um, interview yesterday, you know, what, what is kind of your mission? And I said, well, it is to um, help people enter into deeper conversation with the mystery of God in their own lives. That's, that's, that is the errand upon which God sent me to earth, right? It's like, Ian, I want you to be the guy. Now, that's my story. And that story fits under the larger redemption agenda program of God. And, and that story of mine is, is meant to, in some way, um, accelerate or help the story of God to be realized in the world. Now, I say that with humility because mm -hmm. I'm just one teeny little chain among billions of other stories out there, right? But if we all could bring our personal stories into alignment with God's greater story, to the degree that we do that, the more happiness and joy and satisfaction we'll, and, and a sense of purpose and meaning that we'll, we'll have in life. Yeah, thank you for that. The high percentage of my listeners are local church leaders. I'd like mm. to just wrap up before we get to the dreaded gauntlet, which is imminent. Uh, just, <laughs> just like to uh, just get your take on the pressures that local church leaders face. I think in some ways, one of my jobs on the earth is to help local church leaders understand that they can be exactly human sized and that's enough. I, I think we feel all these pressures. You've been in local church leadership. Uh, what pressures are you seeing that local church leaders are facing nowadays? Um, how can your work uh, help them you know, make sense of that? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is a quote from Chasing Francis, where uh, the, main, the, the main character's mentor says, all, all ministry begins at the ragged edges of our pain. And I, I think... One of the things that would help pastors is to recognize that the best thing they can do is to lead with their weakness, not their strengths. Lead with their weaknesses. Now, that sounds so counterintuitive, but then again, you know, that usually means when you run into a paradox, that usually means that God is somewhere in the room. Mm. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, and so I, I do believe that that leading with your weakness. And by the way, I got to credit my friend Mike Cusick with, with uh, saying that to me uh, or saying it to a room full of recovering addicts that I was a therapist on a, a weekend that Mike was leading. And just, I felt such a comfort in that moment. Lead with your weakness. That's where your strength is. You know, like your strength is in your weakness. Um, and then I think every pastor has to figure out how, what does that look like, you know, in, in my own life. But, I, you know, this is a very biblical idea. Paul says, you know, where you're weak, that's where you're strong. And so that's, that's where I think um, pastors have to resist the cultural pressure to... Um, be, I don't know, the paragons of, of, of spirituality, of Christian, the Christian life. It's like, nah, actually, you know, lead with true authenticity from, from the place of your weakness, uh, and you'll be surprised at, at the results, you know, really. 
fantastic gift because golly, I, who, I got plenty of weakness to work with. <laughs> yeah. What you're offering there, I think is such a relief from pressure. I, I love what you just, you, right at the end there, you took like this idealized, fictionalized Christian life that actually no one's living. Mm-hmm. Right. Stop perpetuating that and, and show a yes. human, a human on display. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Ian, uh, you know, word of this has spread far and wide. I'm sure you heard about it years ago. The gauntlet of anxiety questions. We'll ask this three or four. Uh, the first one is, um, we've been doing some family of origin work on the podcast lately. What would be one asset that you've inherited from your family story? And what would be one liability? Oh, well, I'd say one, one asset um, is I learned resilience, the capacity to bounce back. As I mentioned earlier, I grew up with a father who was uh, an alcoholic and a drug addict, uh, succumbed to that disease at the end of, uh, died in, at the age of 63. Um, uh, we, lived, we grew up in absolute chaos. Uh, and, uh, but what I learned in the middle of that was uh, the capacity to bounce back. Um, I, I learned from my parents also about the power of words of language. That, that was a gift. I, um, they were very literate people. And so that, that despite their, you know, other problems, they, they were that, um, you know, I also came out with a kooky, weird Irish sense of humor in the face of suffering and pain. You know what I mean? Like I just, I learned to, uh, be able to see the irony and the absurdity sometimes in the midst of suffering. And, uh, that, that really helped me out. Um, liability, I would say, you know, I had to kind of, when I was a young man, I had to start guessing what normal was. I had grown up in such an abnormal situation that I just went out into the world completely ill-equipped to figure out what normal was. You know, now I could, I just would copy other people. I'd say, okay, well, that looks like normality. So I'm going to copy that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and in some cases, instances that really was a good thing. In other instances, it was not right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that, that ultimately, and I still struggle with it, at times, it's very Enneagram for me, this belief that I'm somehow unredeemably deficient, that, that, I, that I am what I survived growing up. And that is just not true, that I am not what I survived. Uh, I am not defined by what I experienced growing up. But sometimes that, that liability does come to the surface. And I, I have to say, that's an old story. I got a new story. Hmm. My old story was titled Lost Boy, and my new story is titled Redeemed Man, and I have chosen to live in Redeemed Man today. And uh, slowly over time, uh, I'm starting to believe it. You know, we are in the gauntlet, but that does just uh, afford me the occasion to mention in your book, The Story of You, one of the wonderful gifts you give us, Ian, is, is encouraging us to title our old story and new story, which mm -hmm. you just modeled for us. Thank you for that. You know, the podcast is managing leadership anxiety. Most of our listeners are some kind of a vocational leader, not necessarily in the church, uh, but just a simple question here for you. What sorts of relational situations are guaranteed to generate anxiety in your life? When, okay, that's an easy one. Yeah. When, I, when, I pick, when, I, when I have this feeling, real or perceived or belief, that I have disappointed someone, and uh, I, I can, that can light my hair. You know, I always think, you just mentioned Bart Simpson earlier in yeah. relationship to the inner critic. Like I imagine just Bart Simpson with his hair on fire, running around inside my head going, oh no, I've disappointed someone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just this feeling of failure, you know, this feeling, and also that I'm going to somehow or another be punished for, for disappointment. Now, do you see, that's an old story belief. Yeah. That's an internalized message I grew I, that I picked up as a little person. If I fail other people, I will be punished. If I disappoint other people, I will be abandoned by them. That's an old story. That's an old message fueling an old story. And in those moments, I just have to step back and, and ask myself the question, really? Is yeah. that what's going to happen? Yeah. Um, no. And by the way, if it did happen, would we not survive it? And the answer, of course, is yes. And yeah. uh, 
So anyhow, that that's an example in relationships that, man, that that's a pretty common pattern for me. Mm. Okay, three questions to go. This next one's a Rorschach test. Mm. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, I think the problem with the Bible is that it doesn't ever really get us inside the mind of the people. And so what happens is we then project our view onto those people. So if we can get into the temple court, Jesus is on trial for his life in front of Pontius Pilate. Peter is out in the courtyard with a servant girl. Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus, according to Luke, walks out and Jesus looks at Peter. But the author never says the look on Jesus' face. If you'd be willing to just in very briefly, what is the look on Jesus' face according to the lost boy? And what is the look on Jesus' face toward Peter according to the redeemed man? Oh, that's a great question. Dang you. Okay. Um, I would say that, of course, I, and I think this is because, uh, I mean, all of us do this, but, you know, uh, certainly I think my experience as a young man was that God had abandoned me to an insanely crazy family and that somehow or another it was personal. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, yeah. that this was an intention on God's part and, and somehow it's like, what did I do? You know what I mean? And so there was this kind of, uh, angry God, very common, I think, among people. Uh, but then, okay, in the Bible, this is very interesting to me, and I use this all the time with people and, and with myself. There are two words for see, right? Or it's implied that there are two words for seeing. One is the visual act, act right? Right now, I see you, right? That's just uh, my biology, right? Our physiology. But there's another word for see, which we there's, so there's no equivalent for this in English, um, which is behold, mm. and it's an entirely different word. Mm. And what what behold the best way to describe beholding is you know the look that comes across a mother's face when she's gazing into the eyes of her brand new baby, mm. and I've never seen that look anywhere else at any other time. It's this softness, this soft gaze comes over the mother's face. And there's so much, it's unnameable, it's so mysterious mm, and, mm. and sacred and holy. It's this gaze of unconditional love of where the, ch the mother is in awe of the existence of that baby. And the baby looks back and actually sees the mother's uh, beholding and has this sense of, I am, I exist, and I am beautiful. I think the gaze that comes, I think the gaze that God I think that God, yes, sees us, but I think more importantly, mm. God beholds us. Mm. That God looks with us at us with the soft gaze of the mother. And I, I have to believe that Jesus' face in that moment, because of his divinity, uh, was a mirror of that soft gaze of the mother mm. uh, looking at this beautiful, beautiful child. Mm. Yeah. Ah, oh, thank you. All right, two to go, Ian. We're on the home stretch. Uh, if you'd be willing to fill in the blank. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, I'm, right. I'm, I'm boxing an Enneagram 4. What am I doing? Um, what if I were at least as blank to myself as God is? What if I were at least as blank to myself as God is? I don't know. The first word that comes to my mind is content. Mm. What if I were as content with myself as God is? Mm. In other words, as content as God is with me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like. You know, St. Augustine um, has this quote that he ascribes. This, he, he says, this is how God speaks to us. I love you. I want you to be. That, that's an amazing idea, isn't it? That God mm. wants you to be. Mm. And I, I love this idea that, that, that is it possible that God is content with me? Because I think we feel this terrible pressure all the time, right? Like God is discontent. We must do something to win his, uh, win his favor. It's like, no, what if, you, what if God was content with you? What if there was this divine patience, you know, like you're going to get there. Don't worry. You know, I'm the author and perfecter of your faith. We're going to get there. But even now I'm content with you. Mm. Okay. Uh, the final question, oddly enough comes from Dana Carvey, the old mm -hmm. Saturday Night Live comedian, in an interview he had with Jerry Seinfeld on Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. I, I watched Dana ask Jerry this question. I, I co-opted it, so it's not original with me. 
When in your life recently have you felt most fully and completely loved? Oh, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big walker. I like to walk in the woods a, a lot. And, uh, you know, over, I have these moments, and I'm sure you do too, when, you know, the, you begin to look at the world and suddenly it seems to be brimming with God's grace. Every tree, every, the, the, every cloud, the lake, everything just seems to shimmer with the presence of God. And you can't, and you can't manufacture these moments, right? It's almost a moment of like, it's almost mystical. It's this, it's this sort of sense that, oh, wow, everything is connected. Mm. Everything is beautiful. Everything is loaded with grace. There is this note that this musical note that runs through the stars and runs through the, runs through the birds, runs through us. And um, I had a few instances of that this summer. And whenever that happens... I, and by the way, it often happens to me too, listening to music. Um, when, when I just have this powerful, overwhelming sense of the, the, the presence of God's love. And you mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to circle us around this feeling that all shall be well, all shall be well, that all manner of things shall be well. And uh, the, I just think that those are the moments for me most that I feel profoundly loved, connected, not alienated, not, not this feeling of perpetual separateness, but this feeling of, of the love of God connects me with everything. And, it, and that love is in everything. I, I read a quote yesterday I loved. It said, scratch the paint on anything and you'll find God's face. <laughs> Isn't that great? Nick, scratch the paint on anything and you'll find God's face. And, and uh, <laughs> in, in those moments out there, I, there is this moment of, of, you know, it's almost like you just scratch the paint on the universe and you go, damn it, it's all love. Mm. It's all love. That's what I feel. Mm. Ian Cron. Latest book is The Story of You, just released in December. It's still fresh. Uh, You can pick it up everywhere books are sold. Of course, we'll have links in the show notes, not just to Ian's book, but also to his deeper resources. He has a a deep community who want to dig into the Enneagram together. Ian is a household name for a reason. First of all, he's done his own deep work. Ian has stewarded his pain in the wonderful words of Fred Beekner. Uh, Ian has taken his life and really stewarded it. He's also gone deep in research. But I think what I am so grateful for, Ian, is how you, you, your ability to craft that depth into something accessible for the rest of us. I think that's why you're as busy as you want to be right now. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the MLA podcast. Uh, I, I had high expectations for our time and it's, it's fully exceeded it. This has been a delight for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. It was a delight for me, too. For more resources, visit stevecusswords.com or missyoualliance.org. 